Good morning. Thank you for tuning in with us today. Just think about this for a moment. There are people all around the globe from different backgrounds of life who are tuning in for one common purpose, and that is Jesus. I want to invite you today, whether this is a really intriguing mystery to you or whether you've had a relationship with God for a long time, take a moment today and let's focus in and see what God may have for you. Welcome to Circle Church. It's awesome to be here. For those who don't know, my name is David Castrillion, and I am the lead pastor of Circle Church, along with my beautiful wife, Brooke, and our incredible team. We have a mission of connecting people to Jesus through this online ministry. One, right now, we're 100% online. We don't have a physical location. We don't have a church building where we're meeting. We're actually meeting right now in my living room, but we got the mandate from God that we were supposed to connect people to Jesus online, and that that would be the first step in this process. We're going to be building a studio here um, in, in the new year. For some of you, you know that we had a budget of $41,000 to buy all of the studio equipment that we're using right now to broadcast this live stream. And by the grace of God, we didn't meet that budget, but we surpassed that budget. So we thank God for that. We were able to purchase all of the equipment that we need, and we did it in about Less than two weeks, God showed up and provided over $60,000 worth of resources. And so whenever you have a question about God, are you really in this? Are you really moving? Are you, you, know, you just have to step back and look at the fruit of what's happening. And so we know this is bigger than us. Um, this is about what God is doing on the earth, and we are just stewards of that work. And so we're excited to see what the new year holds. We're looking forward to it. We're going to have an awesome New Year's Day service, so we want to encourage you to tune in with us, to share this link with people, to start the new year off right, right? It's not just a New Year's resolution, but we're actually going to start the new year off right, and we're going to continue to maintain that. We want to stay in the Word of God. We want to stay. So we're going to be talking about how we're going to do that as a church, how we're going to be doing some discipleship and going together through devotionals and looking at the word of God, not in a way that it's just one and done, but in a way where we're able to create a lifestyle around it, where we're able to create habits around being in the word of God. It should be the first thing we do when we wake up, not we get to it eventually if we get to it later on in the week. No, no, no. We're going to start the year off right. So I want to encourage you, share our uh, social media platforms with as many people as you can and join us on January 1st. We're going to start the new year off right. And then of course, we're going to be casting vision for what God is doing through Circle Church. Like I'm mentioned, we're going to start building our studio out there on this property. So it's an incredibly exciting time to be alive. And we thank God for giving us uh, the opportunity to be a part of what he's doing. So go ahead and just take a moment right now, if you're watching and share this video, share this live stream. Maybe it's an archive. Maybe we've already streamed it and you're watching it after the fact. That's okay. God is still able to use archives. You're not watching this by accident. God has something for you today. And I want you to just stop what you're doing right now and share this link because that is the only only way we can get this word out is if you share it. So if the word doesn't get out, it's because you didn't share it. No pressure. We need you. Every person watching right now is a minister of the gospel of Jesus who should fulfill the mandate that he's put on us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. So go ahead and share this um, on your profile. Share it with a friend who may need an encouraging word as we talk about this Christmas, but not yet quite Christmas message out of the book of Luke chapter one. The book of Luke gives us an account of the birth of Jesus. But before that, it gives us the account of a, the birth of another very special person. And so I want to open up in the book of Luke, chapter 1, starting with verse 5 through 25. We're going to do a little bit of reading here, and then we're going to dissect this passage and see what God is speaking to us during this Christmas season through his word. Verse 5, it says, When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife was Elizabeth, who was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, kind of like they told Brooke would be possible with her. And they were both very old. Everybody say very old, very old, very old, very old, ancient. One day, Zechariah was serving, with, serving God in his temple, for his order was on duty that week. 
as was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by a lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken, I would have been too, and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will, he, you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say he will be great in the eyes of man. It says he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be great in the eyes of the Lord and be a man after his own heart than be a man after the world's own heart. I'm, that's just me. I don't know. Maybe somebody shares that opinion with me. He must never touch wine or alcoholic drinks. He must be filled with the Holy Spirit or he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Now, let me just pause right here. Hadn't planned on saying this, but I'm gonna interject it just because some of you know my story, and if you don't, you're gonna hear a testimony about my life next week. So make sure you turn, tune in for our Christmas Day service, and you're gonna hear a testimony about my life, okay? It says he was, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. For those who say that life happens after birth, I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit, you know, the creator of the universe, was filling a human being, human life, before he was born. It doesn't say the fetus was filled with the Holy Spirit. It says he, 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 he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So your destiny, listen to me, your destiny starts before you ever leave the womb. God has a plan for your life before you ever leave the womb. I'm going to leave that right there. Verse 16, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will, be, he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and will cause those who are rebellious to accept wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now. My wife is also along in years. And the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I had to say, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. Wow, isn't it incredible how that works? God's word actually does come to pass. And went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away the disgrace of having no children. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, that it's a word that you gave me, and I pray that every heart would be open to receive it. I pray that every mind would be open to receive it, and I pray that above everything else, the name of Jesus would be glorified. And it's in that holy name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, you heard the testimony from me and Brooke a little bit earlier on in the service. And um, for those who don't know, we have three children now. So we were told, you may not be able to have children. We need to start freezing eggs. We don't know what's going to happen. And by the grace of God, we have three little bambinos who are downstairs in the basement right now. Lord only knows what they're doing because, uh, you know, they are very vocal. And we're going to leave it at that. They're very vocal. And we thank God for them because every time we look at any one of our children, we remember, just like they did in this story, the goodness of God. We remember the goodness of God that if we hadn't had our faith in a moment of despair, in a moment of trial, in a moment of tribulation, where would we be right now? Would we have just accepted the doctor's report and said, well, I guess we're not supposed to have kids? What, what would our lives look like if, we ha if it had not been for Jesus? So we thank God and we give him all the glory that we have three children. But I remember when we were expecting our first child. If you're watching, just type in, I have kids, I have kids, I have kids. I remember when we were accepting, expecting our first child, it was a big transition to us when we found out we were getting ready to have a baby. Everything, hear me young people, if you're engaged right now and you're thinking you're gonna get married and just have kids immediately, can I just tell you something? Do me a favor, wait a little bit. Just, just wait a little bit, okay? There's no rush. You have plenty of time. 
just, just give it a little bit because when you have a baby, everything changes. You have to prepare the house, right? You've got to stick all those annoying little plastic caps over the, the outlets, right? I was, when I was a baby, I stuck a key into one of the outlets and just about electrocuted myself. That's why my hair is so thick today because I, I stuck a key and it just went crazy. You have to put up baby gates, right? You have to do a lot of things in preparation for the baby. You got to think, is there anything on the counter that the baby could pull off the counter? Is there, you know, is there a knife, is there scissors? You, your, your whole perspective, the way you process everything changes as you prepare for a baby. And this particular baby that they were beginning to prepare for, ironically enough, was destined to prepare the way for a greater baby, right? John the Baptist, he was the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That's who we're talking about, John. The, so, so this man, Zechariah, had the responsibility to prepare the way for the preparer. So, uh, next Sunday, we're going to preach about Jesus coming, right? But I, I want to do a little, a, a little bit of a, a, a preface here, and we're going to talk about the man who prepared the way for Jesus, but even go a little bit farther back and talk about the preparer for the preparer, okay? So that's who we're talking about today. But he had to prepare the way for John the Baptist, who would ultimately be the one to baptize Jesus and initiate Jesus's entire ministry. But the only problem was that, as we read in the text, the preparer was barren, right? She had been given a promise, but it didn't look like there was any earthly way that it could come to pass because her body wasn't functioning and doing what it was supposed to do. And let me just talk to you about the significance of being barren or infertile in that day and age, right? When you couldn't have a child in that day and age, it was considered a disgrace. Because of the culture, if a woman couldn't bear sons for her, for her husband to continue the lineage and to continue the family name, it was actually thought to be a curse from God. Like that woman must have been doing something evil, right? We see it again and again in scripture. We see it with Samuel and his mother, right? We see it Abraham and Isaac. Again and again, these women felt disgraced and they felt like they were no good and they felt like there was something wrong with them because they weren't able to bear children. And so not only was it, oh man, we would really love to have children, but she was publicly disgraced, publicly humiliated because she was not able to bear children. And that was you know, how, how valued life was back then. Nowadays, we have birth control and things like that. We have people that are actually trying not to have babies. Back then, it was so desired and coveted to be able to have a baby, to be able to have a child. And to not have that privilege and that ability was considered a disgrace. Luke 1, 7. Let's start revisiting the text and dissecting it here for the next few minutes. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. Mm. You know, as I was preparing for this sermon, I felt like the Lord just spoke to me and said that maybe somebody is watching and I'm not gonna use those words. I'm not gonna say you're old but you're more mature and you've been around the earth a little bit longer. And maybe you have struggled with the fact that you feel insignificant. You feel, maybe you don't have children and you feel like, God, what is, what is my legacy? What do I really have to offer? And the Lord just spoke this for you as I was preparing. preparing. I, mean, I almost titled my sermon, God's Not Done With You Yet. I almost titled it that. But the title of my sermon is religion or relationship, religion or relationship. But I want you to hear today, if you're watching this sermon and you feel like God may have, you, you may have run your course and God, God said to tell you he's not done with you. Yeah. He's still got a plan for your life. He's still got something for you to do. All you have to do is offer yourself to him, right? They had a choice to make, Elizabeth and Zachariah. They could have said, we're too old. There's no way this is gonna happen. But they came before the Lord. The Bible says they were faithful, they were faithful to do what God wanted. And God is not done with somebody yet. So religion or relationship. Type my title right now into the comments. Religion or relationship. I don't know about you, but if I have to pick between the two, I know which one I'm going with all day long. Religion or relationship. The first thing that I want us to extract from this text is that we have to be careful with customs and traditions. Customs. Look at Luke 1, 8 and 9. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week, as was the what? Should be on the screen right now. As was the custom of the priests. He was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. 
You know what? You can't just go through the motions. That's the danger with customs and traditions. It creates this stale relationship. It creates this uh, inability to sense when God is doing something new, to feel his presence like we felt him a little moment ago. You may be watching this right now and you didn't feel the presence of God. You say, I don't know what the hype is all about. I don't know why everybody's getting so excited. I didn't feel anything. If you didn't feel anything, you may be desensitized like Zachariah was, I'm getting ready to show you, because you've gone through the motions for so long out of tradition out of obligation and not out of relationship. You cannot just go through it. Religion is based on tradition, listen, but relationship is built on intimacy. I'm gonna say that again for those of you who are taking notes. Religion is based and built upon tradition, right? This is how we've always done things. These are our customs, but relationship, which is what we're all about here at Circle Church, relationship with a person, relationship with a man who can change your life, relationship is built on intimacy. If you don't have intimacy with Jesus, there's no relationship. What if I try to have a relationship with my wife with no intimacy? And I'm not talking about sexual intimacy, teenagers. I'm talking about relationship with a loving, intimate relationship. What if I tried to say, you know what? I'm gonna talk to you once a week, babe. Good seeing you, 30 minutes a week. That's all I have for you. What kind of relationship would that be? She just said from the tech room, a very sad one. I thank God that that is not our portion. I thank God that the spark is alive. We're in love with each other. Yes, we're raising three small children. Yes, we're in the middle of planting a church. Yes, we have financial uncertainties, but the spark is alive, isn't it, babe? Lord knows the spark is alive. My, my, my. Okay, let me get back into what I'm preaching here. But if we didn't have intimacy, if we didn't talk on a regular basis, if we didn't spend time together, if we weren't texting each other funny things all day, if we were not in connection, it wouldn't be much of a relationship. Yet we try and do that with Jesus. Yeah, I know of Jesus. Yeah, I go to church on Sunday. Yeah, I may even raise my hands, but I don't have a relationship with him. Well, then that's religion. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an intimate relationship, but we have to be careful, especially if you've been in church for a little while. Maybe you're from a Catholic background, like my dad grew up Catholic. It's all about traditions in the Catholic church. It's all about regulations. It's all about customs. It's all about penance and all these different things. It's all about Hail Mary. Listen, Our relationship with Jesus isn't about any of that stuff. It's about talking to someone like I'm talking to you today. But when we look and we see he was in the temple because they cast lots and it was his turn. What are lots? How many have ever heard uh, the Bible discuss casting lots, right? Talking. That's how they made decisions in biblical days. We see it in the New Testament. We see it in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was for strategies of war or to find out if there was sin in the camp. They would actually take, theologians don't know specifically what they looked like, but they would cast something on the ground and based on however, whatever metric system they had, measuring system, they would make a determination based on how these lots would fall to determine what the decision was that they needed to make, right? It was also in the New Testament. We see it with the priestly duties. Like in this case, they cast lots and they said, oh, it's his turn to go into the temple. And that's how they made decisions. But that was a tradition. Hear me today, that was a custom. That's how they sought uh, direction from God in that day and age. But we do not see evidence that lots were used any time in the Bible after the day of Pentecost. Why? Why? because lots were based on tradition, not an intimate relationship. You needed to seek direction from God, but you did not yet have, oh, hear me today, you did not yet have the ability nor the privilege to enter into his glory, to enter into his courts, to enter into his presence and ask yourself. So it was not based on relationship. It was based on tradition and religion. I can't get close to God because I'm not good enough So I have to cast lots and find out what he's speaking to me rather than have enough of a relationship with him to ask him and be spoken to by his Holy Spirit. The new system is built on intimacy, not tradition. Did you hear what I just said? The new system, after Jesus came to the earth, which is what we're celebrating, that's the whole reason for Christmas, was his coming to the earth. After he came to the earth, he established a system based on intimacy and relationship, not tradition and customs. Look at John 16, 12. It says it right here. There is so much more I want to tell you, but, I can't, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of what? Truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but, what, but will tell you what he has heard. 
He will tell you about the future. So now we don't need lots anymore, right? We don't need that man-made tradition, that man-made way. We, we have the spirit of truth right here. It says it in his word. He will lead us into all truth. So let's apply that. How do we apply that in today's day and age? What's a very practical way of applying that? Well, a practical way of applying that is saying, Lord, I have a decision to make it work rather than get some dominoes or marbles or lots or whatever and throw them on the ground and, and figure out, try and decipher what you're, how about I just take a moment and speak to you and say, what should I do? That's it. I want to encourage you today. If you're facing a decision that you don't know which way to go, just stop for a minute and say, Holy Spirit, you said in your word, you are going to guide me into all truth. You're going to lead me into all, what should I do with this decision? And he is faithful so many of you are saying right now, God doesn't speak to me like that. You haven't given God the opportunity to speak to you. You have to stop long enough to hear him respond. He may not respond instantly. You may not hear a voice that says, thus says the Lord with a big white man with white hair, white beard, and a cane. That may not be how God speaks. If he does, that's awesome. I mean, hey, that's cool if God speaks to you. He doesn't speak to me that way. He doesn't appear in a Morgan Freeman voice and say, this is what you have to do, Okay. Sometimes he speaks to you through his words. Sometimes you open up the Bible and you've been praying. I can't tell you how many times I've been praying about something. Even last night, Brooke and I were texting back and forth. We we're praying about something. I opened up the Bible. It just happened to be open up to this passage. I start reading. I'm like, oh my Lord. She had the same thing happen. She, so sometimes he'll use his word. Other times he'll use a, a, a prayer that somebody, but other times he'll use a message with a vessel like me that is jacked up and messed up and imperfect. But every single Sunday, you got to know, I stand out here and before I come out, I say, Holy Spirit, use me as a vessel. Don't we, team? We all did that today. I said, Lord, if there's been anything that we've done, said, or thought that's been displeasing to Jesus, forgive us right now. Wash us and cleanse us so that you can use us. What happens in that moment by faith, we become holy vessels. We become like Mimi, who is my sister, was just given that, that word that God put on. We are then able to be used by God and he speaks through us. So he may not speak to you via text message. Again, if he does, that is awesome. Tell me about it. Comment to me. Send me a screenshot. I want to see it. But most of the time, it's going to be in his word or through a message like this. Number two that we see in the text, proximity does not equal intimacy. Proximity doesn't equal it. Luke 1, 10, 13 says, while the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Now, think about this for a minute. Let's talk about proximity. He was in the temple where the presence of God was dwelling. He, he was in close to the Holy of Holies. He was in the holy place where the incense altar was, right? Do we have that slide? Let's, let's put up the slide of the incense altar. Do we have that? He was, he was in the temple. Okay, there's the slide. So look at the part in red. That is the holy of holies. That is where God himself was dwelling. That's where the presence of Jehovah, of Yahweh, was hovering in there. Now, right there where that little blue box is, is where the incense altar was. And the Bible says to the right of that blue box is where the angel stood. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Zechariah was used to being in the presence of God. He got used to being in the temple. He got used to doing the priestly duties. He got used to offering the sacrifice of incense. He was right there. The only thing separating him from the glory of the creator of the universe, listen, was a curtain. You can take the slide down. You get the visual image of what I'm talking about here. He was in proximity with God. Right? Verse 12, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him John. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid is what he said. God has heard your prayer. He was shaken though. He was shaken. Is it possible that we pray prayers without actually thinking that God's gonna hear them? Do we pray really truly believing that God is going to hear our prayers or do we pray and then we get surprised and we get shaken, right? Like Zechariah, when God actually says, hey, I heard your prayer. Are we expecting intervention from God when we pray? 
Because here I see a passage of a man and I get this picture of this guy just going through the motions. Here I am in the temple of God, whoop de doo this is so nice, oh, this is great. Let me go ahead and offer up you know, the incense. Oh, thanks God, great, all right, see you next year. And walking out. So what happens when God actually shows up and the angel of the Lord appears to me? Oh, 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 you mean all this is real? You mean the prayers that I've been praying have actually been heard? What, what, what's going on with this? This is incredible. When we pray, we have to believe that he hears us. We have to believe that our prayers are making a difference. The problem with building your faith on religious traditions rather than intimacy with Jesus is that what's sacred becomes predictable. It becomes common. What was once the highest honor becomes routine rather than a privilege and an honor. And somewhere along the way, we begin praying out of habit and discipline and ultimately guilt, like, oh man, I really know that I need to be praying, rather than an awestruck wonder that there is someone listening on the other side of those prayers, that there's a creator of the universe who is caring for what you have to say, who is attentive, who is leaning. So, so what happens when God shows up in a supernatural way? Because how many know seeing an angel supernatural? I don't know if I'd be able to handle that. If I saw an angel, man, I, I think every time we see a, 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 a depiction of an angel being shown in scriptures, the angel always has to say, do not be afraid, right? Over and over again, don't be afraid. Don't. Well, that would imply that the angel's pretty alarming to look at, right. right? But we have to believe that there are angels. We have to believe that God has messengers that he's waiting to dispatch on our behalf as soon as we start praying. It's the difference between a faith-filled prayer and a habitual, I gotta pray because it's part of my daily routine. I do my prayers and then I do my, uh, what, what, what is the motivational thing they do um, where, where somebody looks in the mirror and says positive things over themselves, right? Yeah, not declarations. There's a more um, worldly term for it affirmations, affirmations, thank you. Yeah, I do my affirmations, I do my prayers, and then I'm done. All right, bye. No, 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 no. That's not what God wants here. He wants you to know that he's listening because of Jesus. See, and that's the point. Jesus hadn't come yet. Jesus hadn't made a way. He hadn't bridged the gap between us and God yet. So I'm closing this morning as I read you the final part of this passage that I want us to look at. Verse 13, it says, but the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. God has heard your prayer. Wow. Just think about that for a moment. There is a God in heaven. He does hear your prayer and he wants to work on your behalf. The only thing limiting him from doing a work on your behalf may not be, listen, when I say that, I don't want you to take that out of context. It may not be the work that you want. It may not look the way you want it to look. It may not happen in the timing that you want it to happen in, okay? So let me just preface that by saying, God doesn't give you what you want. He gives you what you need. There's, I think there's a book or something that says, I thank God for all of the unanswered prayers. And man, is that the truth in my life. I thank God that he didn't answer so many of the prayers that at that moment I thought was the right decision. And because he didn't give me my way and I screamed and cried like a little brat, no, this is so horrible. But then five years later down the road, I was able to say, oh God, thank you. I saw her high school reunion pictures and I was like, oh Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, I didn't go down that road. <laughs> oh man, it just got carnal really quick, didn't it, for a minute? But there are so many things in our lives that we just have to step back and say, yeah, God, thank you. But I know you're hearing my prayers and I know that you know what's best for me. And I know that you're gonna make a way right now where there seems to be no way. But the great thing about God is he's gracious. He's gracious because verse 18 says, Zachariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now. I'm an old guy. I'm washed up. I'm done. God's done. How can I know God really still wants to use me? I'm not in my prime anymore. I, I remember when I first got into this priestly thing and I started doing the priestly duties, I would walk into the temple and I'd get goosebumps. I'm like, whoa. The person who spoke the universe into creation is in this place. Oh, hear me this morning. Man, I feel the power of God just as Steve starts strumming. Just keep strumming, Steve, right now under that anointing. Yeah. There was a time in your life when you walked in and you said, man, that's where God is behind that curtain? 
be the very person that, that, that spoke the heavens and the earth, that said, let there be light, and there was light, that said, let there be darkness, and there was, that person is behind those curtains right now. And you were awestruck at his incredible glory. But now I'm old. I've been in this for so long. I, I've gone through the motions. I've been around the block. And I see that God doesn't really do the things that we thought he did in the Bible. That was just for those. That, listen, I'm talking to somebody prophetically today. God is gracious, but your words can sabotage what God wants to do in your life. Someone needs to hear that this morning. The words that come out of your mouth can deter the plan of God. Hear me. You have the power. You have the power. God has given you the power. Well, I thought he was all powerful. I thought he could do whatever he wanted. I thought he created the yes, but he gave us the power to choose our fate. He gave us the authority to determine what happens in our lives, whether we're going to serve him or we're not, whether we're going to accept his promises or not. And you can sabotage everything from your mouth. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can stop everything that God's wanting to do in your life right now with the words that you're speaking. But we have good news today. My final point, God is gracious. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now. My wife is well along in years. That was crafty wording there, right? He didn't say my wife's an old hag too. He said, my wife is well along in years. Everybody watching. Take note, that's how you refer to your wife. My wife is well along in her wisdom and maturity. That's even better, I topped it. Then the angel said, I'm Gabriel. You know who I am, homeboy? I'm the leader of these angels. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe, oh, hear me today. Don't miss this. Since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words, my words, my words, my words, my words, my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Now, God is gracious. Why do you say God is gracious? He made the guy go mute. Yeah, he's so gracious that he loves you so much. He'll make you go mute so you don't sabotage the promise that he has for your life. If he's got to take your voice so you don't mess it all up, he'll take your voice because he loves you, because he's gracious, because he knows we're not always going to say the right things. Lord knows some things have come out of this mouth that shouldn't have. Yes, even as a pastor, Lord, forgive me. No one's perfect, but he's gracious. The Bible says he, he made him go silent. Verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Why? Because he probably would have gone with his drinking buddies and his domino, well, not, not drinking buddies, he was a priest, but his domino playing buddies, right? He probably would have gone and told them, yeah, you're not going to believe the craziest thing happened. God said, I'm going to have kids. I'm in my 80s, dude. There's no way that he would have sabotaged. Don't sabotage what God is doing in your life. If you got to be quiet, just shut up. Just shut that thing, man. You talk so much. Just be quiet. Don't ruin it. God's doing something in your life. Don't let your unbelief, even if you don't believe, say, God, I believe, but help my unbelief speak out what you don't feel. You don't have to feel it to speak it. Oh man, someone needs to hear that today. You don't have to feel it to speak it. Start speaking it and then the feelings will follow. 22, when he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Sorry guys, I'll have to catch up with you for bingo later next month. Then they realized from his gestures and the silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. He saw a lot more than a vision. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion. God is gracious. The Bible says that after that, she gave birth to a man named John. He was that crazy guy in the wilderness that ate locusts and all this. But he was the one that God used to baptize Jesus and commission him into ministry. So see, the purpose here that he was getting ready to sabotage was much bigger than God giving him and his wife a son. It was about what I'm going to talk to you about next week. The whole reason for our existence, his name is Jesus. And he was on the verge, oh, hear me today. He was on the verge of sabotaging a vital part of that story. Would God have raised up another? Sure, God would have raised up another John the Baptist. But why should he have to raise up another when he can use me? 
come on. Do you want God to look for somebody else instead of you? Or do you want to say, God, forgive me. God, use me. God, shut me up if I have to be shut up. I want to be used by you. Because the Bible says that after that, his son was born. And some of the family that came, they wanted to name him Zachariah after his dad. It was a family name. It had been passed down from all the other priests. But what happened? The angel had told him and the angel had also told Elizabeth, the name of this baby is to be John. And so they asked him, they're like, John, your wife's losing it, dude. That no one in your family's named John. We got to name this baby Zachariah. Keep the family lineage going on. But how many know he wasn't of that lineage? He was of a different lineage. God had a different purpose for his life. He wasn't just to go into, oh my goodness, I feel the power of God. He wasn't just supposed to go in the temple and keep the routine going. His purpose was not to keep on the traditions and burning the incense. His purpose was to commission the one that made no need for the incense. His purpose was to commission the one that tore the veil so we wouldn't have to offer up sacrifices anymore. So God has put something inside of you that's going to break the mold. God has put something inside of you that is supposed to break tradition. God has put something inside of you that's not going to look like what everyone else is doing. Man, I feel the power of God in this place right now. So don't sabotage it. The Bible says they, they asked him, "What are we? Are we going to name this kid John? Are we going to name him Zachariah?" And that he gestured to them, he, or he wrote down on the tablet, not the iPad tablet. It was the old day tablet. He wrote down on the tablet and he said, "His name's John." Why? Because that's who God named him. That's what God chose his name to be. And as soon as he wrote that down, the Bible says that his voice came back to him. Everyone everyone began praising God and glorifying God, saying, thank you. Thank you, God. You've done an incredible thing. We recognize that you have a purpose for this boy. So right now in this atmosphere, I want to invite you. God has put something inside of you. God has given you a purpose. God has given you a promise. And it does not fit the mold. Hear me today like this jacket doesn't fit me it's too big it's okay it's the style that's what I'm told anyway. right Kai this is the style God has given you something that does not fit the mold it doesn't have to doesn't matter what people think about it. doesn't matter God has given you a purpose and you will not have a point of reference for it they had no point of reference for John when he was born this guy went crazy man he's out there like calling out the government officials They were scared of him, but they saw the power of God at work in his life. They saw miracles, signs, and wonders being done. He was filled with the Holy Spirit before Jesus even gave us the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness. Before he was even born, the Holy Spirit was at work inside of his life. So Father, right now we accept whatever, whatever it looks like, whatever you want for our lives. Who are we to dictate? Who are we to tell you what it's supposed to look like? We accept right now the promise. Forgive us, God, for sabotaging things with our words. Forgive us. But even if you're watching right now and you feel like, man, I certainly have. I've been careless with my words. God didn't make me go mute. I wish he would have because then I wouldn't have messed it. It doesn't matter. Even if you've spoken things out right now in this atmosphere, you can reverse every negative word that has been spoken out of your mouth by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right now, just say it with me. I reverse every word that has been spoken against the plan of God I cancel it now and all of their effects and I speak the will of God whatever it is I want the will of Jesus in my life I thank you by faith I move forward today in Jesus name amen amen just like that just like that every negative word that has been spoken by you or anyone else on your life has been canceled and broken off of your life if you're watching right now you think who's this crazy guy with the oversized sweatshirt on right now this is nuts but maybe you felt something as i was talking a moment ago you felt like man maybe there's something to this if that's you today i want to lead you in a simple prayer a simple prayer to accept jesus not john Not the guy who was preparing the way for Jesus because that's why you got to tune in next week. You're going to hear about the one he was preparing the way for. I want to invite you to just repeat this simple prayer if you want to accept Jesus in your life right now. Say, Jesus, I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. Come on, let's repeat in the room, guys. I ask you to forgive me 
for every sin I've ever committed. Wash me. Cleanse me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Just like you did, John. That I would be bold and courageous to declare the good news of Jesus. Let me be a preparer for the way. To prepare the way for King Jesus. I give you my life now in complete surrender. I thank you now by faith that I am a Christ follower and I have salvation by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. We're so excited for you. And I know it may sound crazy, but everything's different now. Just like that, if you spoke that out, now by faith, it's time to move forward today. We love you. We want to connect with you. Please find us on social media. Reach out to us. We want to know what God is doing in your life. Again, I want to invite you next Sunday. You don't have to even leave your house. Just be in your pajamas and you can hear a Christmas message. And it's a special message because you're going to get to hear from all of our team. I am so excited. We're going to have testimonies. We're going to have folks sharing. It takes a lot of people to pull this off every Sunday. And you're going to hear from each one of them this coming Sunday. Merry Christmas. We love you from Circle Church. God bless you. We're so glad that you were able to tune in and experience all of this together with us. It wouldn't have been the same without you. In fact, our team has been praying for you. And if you accepted Jesus today, we would love to know and be able to connect with you. So please send us a message through one of our social media accounts, or you can email us at info at circlechurch.online. We can't wait to get to meet you.